the book delineates two distinct thematic trajectories. Visual art and aesthetic theory in France and Germany during the period 1830-1848, and the artist as producer in Russia, which explores the impact of Saint Simonist ideologies leading up to the revolution of 1917. The first part delves into the parallels between Saint Simon's endeavor to emancipate production from feudal constraints, and the Saint Simonist inspired critiques of artistic politics within the Holy Alliance. This critique targeted the patronage of medieval and Renaissance religious painting, championed by the Nazarene school, which was seen as emblematic of anti-modernism. In Germany, the Nazarenes, as part of the Romantic movement, became the subject of Heinrich Heine's campaign against the alliance of throne and altar, representing a reactionary spiritualism, that sought to suppress worldly sensualism. Heine's opposition between sensualism and spiritualism, Hellenes and Nazarenes, later resonated in Nietzsche's dichotomy of Dionysus and Christ. Against art aligned with the Holy Alliance, Saint Simon envisioned artists as integral members of the scientific and cultural elite, paving the way for a future utopia. Artists were tasked with fostering the poetic aspects of the new system, and actively shaping social wealth, rather than merely mirroring existing societal norms or eternal essences. Hein, bridging Saint Simonist doctrines in France and Hegelianism in Germany, played a pivotal role in aesthetic debates of the era. In the aftermath of Hegel and Goethe's deaths, Hein redefined the role of art and literature in the burgeoning bourgeois society of post-revolutionary France. He challenged Hegel's assertion of the end of art as a conduit for spiritual expression, advocating for a revolutionary interpretation that accorded artists a central role as heralds of societal change. Delacroix's iconic painting, Liberty Guiding the People, exhibited at the 1831 Salon, epitomized Heine's vision of a new art grounded in sensualism, symbolizing the burgeoning revolutionary spirit of the times. In the intellectual milieu characterized by Heinz, Fuhrbachs, and Bauer's critiques of religion, alongside their juxtaposition of Greek and Christian art, and amidst the Nazarenus ascendancy in artistic patronage, Margaret Rose endeavors to discern Marx's lost aesthetic. This elusive concept, potentially elucidated in Marx's intended contribution to Bauer's Hegel's teachings on religion and art, 1842, aimed to counter the feudal romanticism entrenched in Prussian politics. However, this discussion remains speculative, offering limited insights into Marx's aesthetic theory, compared to subsequent analyses of his seminal works. The Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts, The German Ideology, and The Introduction to the Grundriss. Transitioning from Fuhrbach's exploration of religious alienation to Marx's exploration of economic alienation, Rose contends that Marx grappled with a tension between a Saint Simonist productivist aesthetic, inspired by Schiller's Kantian notion of a realm of freedom, and the recognition that artistic production itself falls prey to alienation. This tension underscores Marx's emphasis on the primacy of production in his theory of alienation and the avant-garde productive art. However, Marx's articulation of how art could both reflect and challenge capitalist alienation remains ambiguous. Rose critiques Marx's unresolved treatment of the Homer paradox, and his inability to reconcile art's role in capitalist society, with its potential for affirmation. 
while Rose's analysis of Marx's early synthesis of Hegelian and Saint Simonist ideas sheds light on his evolving aesthetic perspective, a more promising resolution emerges from Marx's reflections in the German ideology. Here, Marx envisions a communist society where the artist transcends the constraints of local and national narrowness, imposed by the division of labor. In this utopian vision, the artist's identity no longer hinges on a singular art form, such as painting or sculpture, but encompasses a multiplicity of creative pursuits. This radical reconfiguration of the artist's role reflects Marx's broader project of overcoming alienation and dismantling the existing aesthetic sphere, rooted in labor division. Marx's lost aesthetic thus finds its resonance in the communist reorganization of society, where artistic expression transcends the confines of professional specialization. In this liberated context, individuals engage in artistic endeavors alongside other activities, obliterating the hierarchical structures that underpin traditional artistic practices. Marx's aesthetic vision, paradoxically lost within the confines of capitalist alienation, finds its ultimate realization in a society liberated from the shackles of labor division and narrow artistic specialization. Just as communism perceives itself as the offhibbing, or sublation, of philosophy, aiming to transcend and incorporate its insights, so too does communist society aspire to achieve the offhibbing of art as a product of the division of labor. In this envisioned future, everyone will engage in artistic expression, and the distinction between professional painters and amateurs will vanish. Marx's lost aesthetic thus inherently signals its own abolition, envisioning a society where artistic creation is democratized and liberated from the constraints of labor specialization. While Margaret Rose does not explicitly draw this connection, Marx's utopian perspective resonates with the avant-garde movements emerging in the aftermath of World War I, which sought to overcome the institutionalized alienation between art and life. Indeed, Marx's utopianism aligns with the aspirations of Russian constructivism and other avant-garde movements, which envisioned a new society liberated from the shackles of capitalist to lionation. However, Marx's vision of a society where art merges seamlessly with everyday life, stands in stark contrast to the doctrine and practice of socialist realism, which emerged as a form of state-sanctioned art in the 20th century, serving the interests of an alienated industrial production. In this regard, Margaret Rose rightly questions whether there exists a legitimate lineage from the debates of the 1830s, to the avant-garde program of the Russian constructivists. While this lineage may not necessarily pass directly through Marx, it nevertheless finds resonance in his utopian vision of overcoming the division of labor. The trajectory from the debates of the 1830s to the avant-garde movements of the 20th century is not straightforward, particularly within Marxist aesthetics. While Walter Benjamin's exploration of the relationship between high art and industrial production offers some insights, it remains a relatively unexplored terrain within Marxist aesthetics. Despite Giorgi Lukács' efforts to reconnect art with everyday life, the question of art's relation to industrial production has often been overlooked. Yet, this question holds potential for the development of a contemporary lost aesthetics of the avant-garde, grounded in materialist principles. Margaret Rose's scholarly study navigates both historical and theoretical dimensions with commendable depth and breadth. 
by interrogating the place of a productivist aesthetic in Marxist aesthetic theory, Rose opens up new avenues for exploration. While her examination of Marx's aesthetic contributions may be limited, her exploration of the prehistory of 20th century avant-garde movements, enriches debates on the role and function of art, in the transition from Hegelian to Marxian paradigms. The avant-garde movements of the Soviet Union France and Germany in the 1920s, sought to occupy a productive utopian space, between the demise of traditional art forms, and the emergence of new artistic paradigms. In conclusion, Margaret Rose's work on the lost aesthetics of the avant-garde, sheds light on the transformative potential of artistic expression, in the quest for societal emancipation.